Good morning, Europe. Welcome to the program. Our top stories for you this morning. Deadly wildfires. Forest fires spiral out of control in Greece, killing more than 20 people and forcing many more from their homes. A growing scandal. France's interior minister admits in a grilling by MPs he knew that a presidential aide assaulted a protester. Migrant crisis stopgap. Italy says it will now allow migrant rescue ships to dock for the next five weeks, while the EU tries to reach a deal to distribute new arrivals. And over in the Cuba social media news desk. North Korea begins dismantling a missile test site, but is all as it seems. We'll be taking you through the pictures. And what is Steve Bannon up to in Europe? We'll tell you why he's ruffling more than a few feathers in Brussels. Thank you for starting your morning with us. Now, our top story, Greece is calling for international help as the worst forest fires in decades sweep through the country. Well, the government says more than 20 people have been killed and more than 100 are injured, forcing both residents and tourists alike to flee to safety. Hundreds of firefighters are battling the double threat of strong winds and soaring temperatures. Evelyn Laverick has the story. The worst forest fires in a decade are raging across Greece. The death toll keeps rising. Several people died as they attempted to flee in their cars. Witnesses claim to have seen at least four dead on a road in the community of Marti in the region of Attica, east of the capital. The popular tourist destination has been devastated by the fast-moving blaze. Many locals had a narrow escape. Thankfully, the sea was there. We went into the sea because the flames were chasing us all the way to the water. It burnt our backs. It reminded me of the eruption of Vesuvius at Pompeii. What can I say? It's over. We're alive, and that's what's important. Greek Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras cut short a trip to Bosnia to coordinate the response. It's a difficult moment for the region. It's a difficult night for Greece. At the moment, more than 600 men and women from the fire brigade and 300 vehicles have been mobilized on three major fronts. Greece has issued an urgent appeal for help to tackle the fires which are raging out of control in several places. The army has been drafted in to help fight the blazes. People in the region have been told to close up their homes and just leave. Wildfires are not uncommon in Greece, but a relatively dry winter has created tinderbox conditions. Evelyn Laverick, Euronews. And for more on this, uh, European affairs journalist Stefan de Vries is joining me now in the studio. Stefan, I mean, now we see what's happening in Greece, but just last week we had also a lot of forest fires in Sweden. We saw European countries uh, coming in to help, but now Greece is asking for international help. I and mean, what can be done now? Well, the European Union has an emergency response unit and a lot of the, the, the planes and the helicopters that are being used to fight fire, uh, wildfires are now being used in Sweden. So that's a problem um, because there are not many uh, bombing, water bombing planes in Europe available. So uh, that's the reason why Greece is now uh, appealing to, for international help because it has to come from abroad. Um, it, it also shows that there is a real uh, problem in uh, Europe. Uh, already the European Union have been talking uh, a lot about creating a Europe European-wide uh, wildfire brigade uh, that doesn't exist yet, but at least there's international help uh, available. There is coordination as well from Brussels. Um, so Greece uh, will just have to uh, hope that the other countries, the neighboring countries, that they have planes available to help the country to fight the wildfires. So it is a problem of uh, lim limited resources, uh, uh, so to speak. Yes. A and now we've heard, we let's look at the, the environmental part of it. We saw temperatures reaching up to 40 degrees uh, in Greece, and we also see fires in the Arctic circle. I mean, these are described as rare or, or exceptional. Is exceptional the new normal now? Well, it's hard to, to make any general conclusions when it comes to climate change. But at, yeah, the last 10 summers have been the hottest on record in Europe. And let's have a look to this map. This is actually a map released by the European Commission uh, every day. It's a fire um, risk uh, forecast. And we see here that, uh, well, we're used to fires, of course, in Portugal and Spain and Greece, but now we're seeing also uh, red uh, areas in Sweden, Scandinavia, the Netherlands. It has been an exceptionally dry spring already. So this creates an extra uh, 
um, level of danger. And of course, it's also very bad news for the farmers in Europe. Uh, many crops are already destroyed. Uh, many farmers will probably go uh, bankrupt at the end of the, the spring. So that's an, uh, an additional uh, problem of the European Union, which of course it is monitoring uh, everything very closely. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, for now, Stefan de Vries, uh, European Affairs uh, journalist there. Thanks. And later in the show, we will be talking to a scientist from the EU's Earth Observation Programme about the unprecedented temperatures in Europe and across the world. Now, obviously, many civilians have been impacted by this rise in temperature, by the forest fires, and they have been sharing their experiences on social media. Alex and the social media team have been uh, on to this uh, part of the story. Alex? So the Attica region is perhaps the worst affected, and that encompasses Athens. People posting terrifying videos from on the ground. Just look at the fires you can see in this photo. This from user um, Dianis, who we have reached out to and spoken to this morning, and he shared with us the full video of a drive between Petrus and Athens. You can just see along the side of the road, these terrifying fires, both sides, the smoke wiping out the visibility. He told us his wife was terrified by these scenes, as indeed anybody would be, wouldn't you, driving along seeing this? You can, the visibility for other motorists you can see is so uh, dangerously reduced here. So even when the flames themselves might be at a distance, the smoke moving across the road causing a lot of concern. Now, a government spokesman updated us on Facebook, uh, putting out a statement saying at least 20 people overnight had died, calling the fire catastrophic, insurmountable. The idea that this is a huge natural uh, catastrophe that Greece is now struggling to deal with. Also adding that many of those who died were trapped either in their homes or their vehicles, unable to escape the spread of those fires. As we saw in the video just there, you can see them, huge walls of fire moving quickly. And that, those words from the government perhaps make images like this all the more um, upsetting and all, all the more, um, I suppose, it, it makes you pause and think. These are vehicles burned out along the side of the road in Greece. Many people who have lost their lives um, have been... Uh, caught in vehicles like this, this photographer, an Athens-based photographer, saying uh, many people had passed away like this. But just a along and on the coast, people here sharing what they uh, have, has been described as apocalyptic scenes. So while the fire might be further away, they're using clothing and masks, trying not to inhale the smoke. They say they're feeling abandoned, that these scenes, uh, they are struggling now to breathe and they need help along the coast. And certainly that, that feeling that people need help from the government picked up uh, by um, the Greek Prime Minister uh, saying that Greece will do all it can now to help these people. Uh, also, it's worth saying that um, ministers from uh, the, the um, Syriza party are not taking part in debates today. Ministers, are saying, need to focus on dealing with this natural disaster. So the pictures coming from Greece uh, this morning, people sharing these Terrifying pictures, the kind of pictures you'd almost expect to see in a film, but this is real life. And many people saying, even if they've escaped the fire, their homes, their vehicles, their livelihoods, in some cases, totally destroyed. We will have more stories from you from people directly affected as this story develops. I mean, these images just drive home the point is how dangerous and dire the situation there is. Thank you for that, uh, Alex and the Cube team. Well, now, pressure is uh, mounting on the French president, Emmanuel Macron, to explain why his office did not report allegations that his close aide, Alexandre Benalla, had assaulted a May Day protester. Yesterday, during a two-and-a-half-hour grilling by MPs, his interior minister, Gérard Colomb, admitted that he had known about the incident for more than two months. Well, joining us live is our correspondent, Annelise Borges. Annelise, uh, two-and-a-half hours, that was a long grilling. What more did uh, Gérard Colomb say? It was a long and difficult uh, grilling for Gérard Colomb, who basically shifted the responsibility in this case to Emmanuel Macron's office. Gérard Colomb said that once he was informed about the video the day after the incident, he took that information to Patrick Strauda, Emmanuel Macron's chief of staff, and he then believed that the case would be dealt with. Gérard Colomb said it wasn't his responsibility to inform the prosecutor since Alexandre Benalla didn't work for him. It was the responsibility of Emmanuel Macron's team to inform judicial authorities. Take a listen to what France's interior minister had to say. Mr. Benalla was not part of the staff under my responsibility, and both the president's office and the police prefecture had all the information they needed to take action. 
Therefore, I considered that the facts being reported had been acknowledged at the appropriate level, and I did not look further into them. So it wasn't his responsibility. He believed everything had been taken care of. And throughout the two and a half hours that he was questioned, he insisted that that was the case. And of course, those remarks, those comments will increase the pressure on Emmanuel Macron's office to explain, one, why they failed to inform the prosecutor about what had happened, and two, why they kept Alexandre Benalla as a member of the team after sanctioning him for two weeks. Of course, questions like this one, these ones, and many more will be raised over the next few days in those two investigative commissions that have been created, one in the National Assembly and one in the Senate, Tessa. Indeed, as you say, pressure is mounting. So what about Emmanuel Macron himself? We haven't heard from him on this issue. How long can he say, son, and when do we expect him to speak? Well, there's no easy way out of this for Emmanuel Macron. If he speaks now, uh, he will be criticized for attempting to interfere in the investigation. If he doesn't speak, as has been the case, he will be criticized for being out of touch with what's happening in the country. Several PR and marketing consultants have come forward suggesting that Emmanuel Macron should be doing this or that. But the uh, conclusion here is that he missed the opportunity to come out and condemn what Alexandre Benalla had done and actually distance himself from that individual back two and a half months ago. Now, anything that the French president says in this case might be perceived as too little too late uh, indeed thank you for that analysis uh and lise borges there in paris thanks and still to come for you on good morning europe a stopgap measure for the european migrant crisis italy will allow rescue ships to dock but only until a deal is reached with the eu and the boys rescued from a cave in thailand are due to have their heads shaved in a buddhist ceremony later today we'll bring you more after the break Your top story in Good Morning Europe, 50 people are now believed to have died as forest fires spiral out of control in Greece. Now, as a stopgap measure, Italy will allow migrant rescue ships to dock for five weeks while the EU renegotiates its policy in distributing new arrivals among member states. Foreign Minister Enzo Moavera Milanesi had this to say. Durante il periodo uh, necessario, Italy will ensure the arrival in its ports of the people rescued from ships of the Sofia mission during a necessary time for a few weeks while the modification of the operational rules is reached in light of the conclusions of the European Council and in the principles of greater sharing, which should put an end to the arrival of all the people in a single country, as has been the case in recent years. Well, this comes as as a migrant ship enters its 12th day stranded off the coast of Tunisia with 40 people on board. Authorities there have refused to let them dock and the Tunisian Red Crescent say those on board are in bad condition, having been left without aid. Well, our correspondent Brian Carter is live with the latest uh, from Brussels. Uh, Brian, can you just uh, update us on where does Italy stand now on a migration uh, issue and how is the European Union responding? Good morning, Tessa. Well, you heard it from the uh, Foreign Affairs Minister of Italy. This uh, decision to allow ships to dock in Italy only applies to Operation Sofia. Operation Sofia was a mission started in 2015, coordinated by six EU countries to respond uh, uh, to uh, human uh, trafficking in the Mediterranean. So uh, the, since it started in 2015, Mission Sofia has saved about 44,000 people stranded at sea. That is a lot, but it only accounts for 10% of all the uh, savings of all the people saved in the Mediterranean over the last uh, three years. So clearly what Italy wants is to uh, put pressure on EU countries so that uh, Mission Sophia will be able to dock in Italy as long as there's an agreement to welcome 
uh, migrants in different EU member states, as was the case uh, with other countries and other ships that we've seen over the last few days, where some countries have accepted to receive uh, migrants and then Italy decided to let the ships in. So uh, on this uh, part of Sofia, there will be maybe an agreement. The uh, mandate of Sofia ends at the end of this year, but there's still a lot of questions regarding the other uh, uh, ships that are saving uh, migrants, mainly the NGO ships operating in the Mediterranean. And, and Brian, this is a crisis that's been going on for several years now, and the EU has been accused of, you know, kicking the can down the road. Now we have a temporary stopgap measure, but it, are they any closer to coming up with an actual solution that could stick and stay? Well, on Mission Sophia, they gave themselves uh, five weeks. Uh, we will see whether that period will be enough. But today, the European Commission is set to uh, propose uh, its own um, proposals on uh, fighting against uh, this uh, issue of migration. One is to act as a sort of coordinator between the different countries. And today, the EU should also clarify what it meant last month when it, uh, the member states talked about these disembarkation platforms and these control centers. Those control centers are basically uh, areas where migrants will be uh, staying whilst their application is being processed in the EU. The disembarkation platforms is basically the same thing, but in other countries, in African countries. The problem is, so far, not a single North African country has agreed to welcome these disembarkation platforms. Uh, so there's still a lot of uh, work to be done. Uh, and uh, we it's hard to see whether uh, EU countries will try to find a different solution to this crisis, which uh, up to now has focused mainly on uh, um, uh, making the external borders uh, more secure. Indeed, hard to get a deal done, a plan uh, implemented without the other side agreeing. Thank you for that, uh, Brian Carter there in Brussels. Thanks. Now, the British Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, has warned that the UK is at risk of crashing out of the EU with no deal by accident if the EU don't change their approach. Well, speaking in Berlin after a meeting with German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas, Hunt told reporters that the only person that would be satisfied with a no-deal Brexit would be Vladimir Putin. Well, Hunt's visit to Berlin comes as British cabinet members are traveling across Europe this week, hoping to sell Theresa May's Brexit strategy to the continent. But with the final UK-EU summit looming, Prime Minister May has said that the Britain is ramping up plans for a breakdown in talks. And joining us uh, live with the latest is correspondent Bryony Williams. Bryony, is Britain really expecting a no-deal Brexit here? Well, the UK government is walking an extremely fine line at the moment. On one hand, it's trying to say to EU negotiators that it won't be backed into a corner, so we'll be ready for a no deal. But then on the other hand, it's warning that no deal won't be good for either side. So the political rhetoric has changed in, in recent weeks when we had Theresa May, the Prime Minister, saying that a bad deal was better than no deal. But that seems to have shifted. As you mentioned, UK Minister will be across the EU this week selling that Brexit blueprint. They've said it's not a charm offensive, just a concerted effort to get everyone focusing on Brexit. Jeremy Hunt was speaking in Germany yesterday. So without a, a real change in approach from the EU negotiators, uh, we do now face a real risk of, of no deal by accident. Well, that was the Foreign Secretary talking about a no deal. Theresa May, the Prime Minister, was in the north of England yesterday saying that contingency plans are ramping up for a no deal scenario. We've heard that there have been more jobs advertised on the border agency and for the tax office here in the UK, and that the National Health Service is stockpiling medicines. There's also concern that because 40% of the food that consu is consumed here in Britain comes from the EU, that there will be tailbacks of over 20 kilometres at the border. And it seems that it's far from, uh, a solution is far from clear. It's full steam ahead for the team of Theresa May here in Europe. But in fact, it is the last day of the British Parliament, isn't it? 
Yes, it is the last day that Parliament sits here in the UK and the Brexit Secretary Dominic Raab will be answering questions from MPs over the negotiations in Brussels, just how far they've come along. It's a continuing baptism of fire for him because of course he's only been in the job for a few weeks. It all comes as an, a report from another group of MPs is warning that security and public health might be put at risk if there is a no deal. Now let's just remind ourselves we've got 12 weeks until that October cutoff when the EU and the UK is meant to have some kind of negotiation drawn up. Now there's a heat wave going on in the UK at the moment and I'm sure on the last day in Parliament the political temperatures will be rising too. Indeed, and that time is going to fly by. Thank you very much uh, for that to Bryony Williams in London. And still to come for you on the programme, Canadian officials have named the man responsible for a mass shooting in Toronto. And over in the Cube. Bring you the pictures as North Korea appears to be dismantling a missile testing site. We'll suggest what it could mean after the break. You're watching Good Morning Europe. Welcome back to the program. Now, the gunman who killed two people and injured 13 others in Toronto suffered from mental health issues, according to his family. The shooting took place at a busy restaurant district at around 10 p.m. on Sunday night. The gunman was killed at the scene, but his reason for shooting still remains unclear. As NBC News' Gabe Gutierrez reports. Toronto's Greek town, one of Canada's most popular neighborhoods, is shut down. Apparently multiple shootings in the area at Danforth. Police swarming the scene after gunshots ripped through Danforth Avenue. Yeah, I heard at least 20 shots. You know, clip being spent, reloading, clip being spent, reloading, clip being spent. That's what I heard. And then I saw the carnage as I ran down the street. The gunman dressed in all black. Seen on this chilling video posted on social media. One woman ran and she fell and he went over her and shot her twice. And, uh, Point blank. Carrying a shoulder bag, he suddenly stops, pulls out a handgun, and opens fire, shooting 15 people. So we had a calm about him, that I can say, and he started shooting just right past us. Did you think you were going to make it out? You know, I don't think we had time to really think. Jody Steinhauer was inside one of the restaurants nearby with her family celebrating her birthday. Thank goodness my birthday cake uh, was 10 minutes late because if we had finished 10 minutes earlier and we would have walked out of the restaurant and where the shooter was. The 29-year-old gunman from Toronto identified as Fasal Hussein died after a shootout with police. Again, I can't speak to what was in this individual's mind. Traditionally, gun violence has been rare in Canada, but in Toronto, there's been a recent spike, with violent shootings more than doubling in the past three years. U.S. law enforcement sources tell NBC News the gunman was not on any watch list. Investigators have not ruled out terrorism. But late today, the gunman's family said that he had battled psychosis and depression his entire life. Gabe Gutierrez, NBC News, Toronto. Now, new satellite images appear to show North Korea dismantling a satellite launching station that was used to develop engines for ballistic missiles. Well, Alex has been looking into how significant this is. Alex. Tessa, it's easy to forget, isn't it? We had Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un in front of all the world's news cameras last month. It's easy to forget that North Korea is arguably the most secretive nation in the world. So for us to get a sense of what's going on, we often have to rely on satellite images. Images like these. These have been released by 38 North, which is a think tank that watches North Korea. They have been using satellite images to, um, to monitor North Korea's commitment to dismantling key sites which have been used in the development of their missile program. Now, this site, um, the Sohai Satellite Launching Station, they say has, they've now found evidence to suggest two key features have started to be dismantled. Let's not forget this is the site that just in 2016 was launching rockets that the West saw as North Korea testing its ballistic missile capabilities. Pyongyang always insisting this was about satellite launches, but obviously that was an ongoing discussion. But at the um, summit in Singapore, there was a real emphasis on North Korea taking steps to denuclearize. People now saying, well, it seems they're taking steps to strip back this site. So let's look at the images. The first key feature 38 North point out is um, a mobile, a rail mounted transfer building that basically moves rockets on to the launch pad. Now they say this site is showing signs of being dismantled. This item here is a crane 
And these items here you can see on the ground are dismantled sections of this rail-mounted transfer structure. So they're saying that this is now showing evidence of being partially, uh, partially dismantled. Then there is the engine uh, testing site, the vertical engine uh, testing site. Let's just bring that up for you. Again, um, these are satellite images, so we're getting only a perspective. We're not on the ground. It's hard to know exactly what's going on, but saying here that the test stand structure used to test the engines of rockets, as I say, the West um, pointed out, were being used to help North Korea's missile program. Well, this, they say, the superstructure is being removed, the panels taken off it. There's also construction vehicles shown around here. So many people saying this is North Korea taking a step towards a pledge made at that summit to take out of action a missile testing site. There are some more cautious voices in this discussion, though, including uh, Jonathan Cheng of the Wall Street Journal, who says that actually this site has diminished in importance as North Korea's program has moved to rely more on mobile launch sites. So the suggestion here, maybe it isn't as significant as some might say. Um, Ankit Panda as well writing in The Diplomat that actually um, a lot of the changes so far in his analysis are reversible. These sites could be brought back to life but again saying we do not know what's going on on the ground but it seems like a significant step. Donald Trump tweeting yesterday he's happy with the state of progress so we'll keep you posted um, with how things are going. Tessa. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Alex and the Cube team. Now, the duck boat, which capsized during stormy weather on a lake in Missouri, has been recovered from the water by the U.S. Coast Guard. Seventeen people drowned in what was one of the worst tourist accidents in the U.S. for years. The boat had, has been handed over to investigators who will look into the causes of the accident. Now, following their incredible rescue, the 12 boys released from a cave in Thailand have arrived at the Doi Wao Temple, where they will be ordained in a Buddhist ceremony later today. They will have their heads shaved before spending 10 days living in different monasteries. Their coach, who kept the boys in high spirits during their time trapped in the cave, has already been ordained as a monk. And this morning, the Australian divers who took part in the rescue of those Thai boys were awarded the country's highest awards for bravery. At a ceremony which took place at Government House in Canberra, they were honoured for their crucial role in the two-week rescue operation. And coming up, we will have all of your top stories, including more on that heat wave that is gripping parts of the world. We'll be talking to a scientist to find out what could be behind this. Plus, what's at stake as the EU Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker arrives in the United States for talks with Donald Trump. And Trump's former aide, Steve Bannon, he is causing quite a stir in Brussels. He announced plans to open a foundation to support far-right anti-establishment groups in Europe. But first, uh, let's leave you with today's no comment from Greece, where wildfires continue to rage just outside of Athens. Top stories on Good Morning Europe, deadly wildfires. More than 50 people are now believed to have died as forest fires spiral out of control in Greece. Growing scandal. France's interior minister admits in a grilling by MPs that he knew that a presidential aide assaulted a protester. Migrant crisis stopgap. Italy said it would allow migrant rescue ships to dock for five weeks while the EU tries to reach a deal to distribute new arrivals. Our top story, at least 50 people have died and over 100 have been injured in Greece's worst forest fires in decades. Well, local officials say 26 bodies were discovered near a beach in the Athens resort of Mati. The mayor says the group is thought to have been attempting to flee the fires. Well, hundreds of firefighters are battling the double threat of strong winds and soaring temperatures. As people are urged to flee their homes, the government is calling for international assistance to tackle the situation. Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras cut short a trip to Bosnia to coordinate the response. Although wildfires are not uncommon in Greece, a relatively dry winter has created tinderbox conditions. And it's not clear how these fires started. And as higher than normal temperatures ravage much of Europe and the world, the consequences of hot weather are starting to show their effects. Well, in Japan, record high temperatures have seen dozens of deaths as thermometers have been 12 degrees hotter than the seasonal average. Disaster management agencies are urging people to stay inside as people pour water over pavements in an attempt to cool the streets.
In the UK, formerly green fields have turned to beige as there has been no rain in some places for 54 consecutive days. The country, internationally famed for its rainfall and inconsistent summers, heated up to 33 degrees this week and temperatures are predicted to rise. Parts of the country have introduced a ban on hose pipe use amid Britain's longest heat wave in 42 years. And in Sweden, the hottest summer for 260 years has seen over 25,000 hectares worth of wildfires burn across the country. That's including in the normally mild Arctic Circle. Swedish, Swedish authorities have called in help from across Europe with Norway and Italy sending firefighting teams to tackle the blaze amid the longest drought in 74 years. Well, temperatures are reaching record highs across the planet from Japan to Sweden, as we've just told you, and the effects being felt in the form of wildfires, droughts and much more. Well, joining us to get a handle on the climate science behind all this is senior scientist Freya Vamberg from the European Union's Earth Observation Program. Copernicus, uh, Freya, thank you for joining us. Uh, you know, we just saw there a lot of record numbers uh, across Europe and around the world. How do these fit into the bigger picture of climate change? How do we discuss this, put it in context? Well, first of all, as I'm sure you've heard many times before, just having one event, you can't link that straight away to climate change without doing further analysis. And since these events are ongoing, this analysis is still outstanding. It will have to be done um, post-event. And even post-event, we might not be able to say clearly whether this is related to climate change or not. Um, what we do expect, of course, is with climate change for these kind of heatwave events, to become, um, to be something that we'll see more often. With droughts and fires, um, it's a little bit more complex because there you also have the rainfall playing into the picture. And with rainfall, if we look at Europe, for instance, there is not necessarily a clear trend if rainfall is increasing or decreasing. So if we have the combination of warm temperatures, but average rainfall, then we might not see a drought, whereas what we've seen in the last three months, or more or less three months since yeah, May... Yeah, the fact that this is, is happening, yeah, the fact that this is happening all at the same time in the different parts of the world at the same time, this is alarming for people. So are, can we, how, how long do we expect this to continue? Or is this part of a cycle? Well, so it depends a little bit on what you look at. I think if we look at the globe, we have to always stress there's a lot of variability in the system. So if we look at... Um, earlier months during the year, we had quite a lot of cold events in Europe. So from month to month, we will see different things happening. Um, when we look at just the very short term, so the next couple of days, as you said earlier in the program, there are forecasts for these high temperatures to remain. Um, but that's... All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Freya Vanberg from the European Union's Earth Observation Program, Copernicus. Thanks. Well, with the prolonged heat and drought, summer harvests across Europe are expected to suffer, with wheat output across the EU predicted to shrink. Poland and Latvia have already declared a harvest. The harvest, a natural disaster. Well, joining us now is Guy Smith, the deputy president of the UK National Farmers Union. Thank you for joining us uh, on the program. You know, we, we, we saw from the, the scientific uh, part of this, but what about the impact on people, especially farmers? What, ha what has that been like? Uh, well, we're just harvesting our, our the crops we sow in the in the autumn at the moment. Uh, they don't seem to be significantly impacted. They're down about 20, 25 percent. Uh, we think they've been saved by the fact that this drought comes on the back uh, of a wet period in the spring uh, and the winter. Uh, but there is concern about those crops that were sown in the spring. Uh, because ironically, they were sown in bad conditions because of the wet at the time, uh, and then they've barely experienced rainfall since. Uh, and we expect that those yields to be halved from what would be normal. Uh, and then crops like vegetables, which are reliant on irrigation even in normal years. Uh, the problem there is that the reservoirs of water that farmers use on their farms uh, are running dry. Uh, and on this farm, we don't think we're going to be able to irrigate potatoes beyond next week. Uh, and that will really start to impact on both quality and yield quantity. And Guy, as that impact on yield happens, what about impact to consumers? Uh, will, will, will they be seeing any shortages or uh, price increases? 
I think it's too early to tell. Uh, I think we will have a smaller harvest than, than normal, uh, but food is globally traded um, and there are some parts of the world that are still producing OK. Uh, but I think if these weather patterns continue uh, uh, in Britain and across northern Europe, uh, there are going to be um, significant um, supply problems uh, and that could well mean we have higher prices in the shops. And Guy, just very quickly, have you had to adjust uh, the way you do farming in the UK, just looking ahead into more weather changes, for example? Well, farmers always have to adjust to the weather they have, and every year is different. Um, it, it does seem to me, uh, as a farmer in his 50s, uh, that we are moving from more extremes more often. So we go from extreme wet to extreme dry. Uh, and that is making farming more challenging. Uh, and I'm thinking about investing in uh, greater reservoir capacity uh, so I can irrigate crops uh, in dry right. times uh, and making sure my, my land is well drained because uh, in the wet times uh, I need to shift the water from the surface of the fields. All right. Thank you very much for giving us that, that insight. Guy Smith, the Deputy President of the UK National Farmers Union. Thank you. Thank you. Now, after weeks of tit-for-tat exchanges between the EU and the U.S., European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker is preparing to head to Washington for trade talks with Donald Trump. Well, Juncker's trip is seen as an effort to de-escalate tensions as fears grow of a damaging trade war, but he won't present a specific trade offer to the U.S. president. Last week, Trump described the bloc as a, quote, foe when it comes to trade and said that the U.S. was losing billions of dollars to the Union. So what can we expect from this meeting? Sir Graham Watson, a former member of the European Parliament's International Trade Committee, joins me now live from Brussels. Uh, Sir Graham, thank you very much for joining us on the programme. What do you expect? What is likely to come out of this meeting? Well, I hope we'll have sensible discussions. I mean, you know, the United States makes more money out of trading with the European Union than it does with anybody else. We are the top destination for American exports. At the same time, Europe is their largest investor. 72% of all their foreign direct investment comes from the European Union. And I hope that both sides will recognize this and that we can talk down the language Stop talking about trade wars. Recognize that it's companies that trade, not countries, and that the role of the countries is to create a stable framework for that trade to take place. Because transatlantic trade supports 15 million jobs. As you rightly say, the, the talk, it's a talk that's been building, uh, and Donald Trump doesn't seem like he's going to back down. Do you think oh, what's happening now, uh, this, even this visit, is, is it just posturing, or, or do we really expect something concrete to come out of it? No, I think it's not posturing at all. Certainly on the European Union side, there is a very real worry that the liberal world order is under threat that if the United States and the European Union work together, we are capable of defending that world order, and that this is the time to unite rather than to sow division. You know, the European Union is working very successfully with Canada, with Mexico, with Japan, with other countries to uphold a rules-based world trade order. We don't want to see that destroyed because our prosperity is built upon it. And I hope that Jean-Claude Juncker will be able to calm down Donald Trump, to calm down his rhetoric and get him to look seriously about how trade works and recognize, for example, that it's not as simple as it sounds. I mean, he's talking about putting tariffs on European cars, but there are some European cars like the BMW X5, for example, which is built only in the United States. It's not as simple as, as it seems when you look at trade patterns and how products end up with parts from different countries in a world supply chain. Indeed, that is indeed what makes uh, global trade so difficult to unpick. It's so intertwined. Thank you very much for your analysis there, Sir Graham Watson, former member of the European Parliament's International Trade Committee. Thank you. And still to come for you on Good Morning Europe, former Trump aide Steve Bannon is causing a stir in Brussels as he unveils plans to set up a foundation to support right-wing anti-establishment groups in Europe. We'll have more after the break.
Your top story on Good Morning Europe. Forest fires spiral out of control in Greece, forcing people to flee their homes and killing at least 50 people. Well, now, the father of a 10-year-old girl who died in Somalia after undergoing female genital mutilation, or FGM, has spoken out in defense of the practice. Dika Dahir Noor died on July 16th, two days after undergoing the procedure. Well, her father said that, quote, people in the area are content, end quote, with FGM, that is. And whilst he had seen the effects, it was part of their culture. Well, the World Health Organization estimates that 3 million girls worldwide and 180,000 girls girls and women in Europe are at risk of FGM every year. Fiona Coyle, director of End FGM European Network, is joining me now. Uh, Fiona, I think first I'd like to see your reaction to the father's statement. How do you react with sensitivity as well, sensitivity as well to someone who says, well, this is part of our culture? Yeah, um, good morning and thank you for having me. Um, I think first and foremost, I think from NDFGM European Network and our members, we sympathise for the father and the family for, for losing their daughter. Um, I think from our perspective and what is recognised internationally is that FGM, it is a human, life, human rights violation, one um, that puts at risk the lives of women and girls. Um, it is a deeply entrenched cultural practice. It's entrenched in tradition and certainly in countries like Somalia, which has the highest rates of, of the practice in the world. Um, it needs to be a very much a community driven um, response. As a network here in Europe, I represent um, 21 members across um, 14 different member states that work with diaspora communities um, it, at grassroots level to, to discuss, to educate and to try and um, overcome this harmful practice. All right, just very, very quickly, uh, you said that this is very entrenched. Uh, how difficult, how big is the, the task on trying to combat FGM in Europe then? I think in Europe, um, FGM is present. It is a global issue. Um, you mentioned in your, in your introduction the stat around 180,000 women and girls being at risk. But we also need to think of the survivors. Um, so at present, there's over half a million women and girls who have undergone um, this, this procedure living in, in Europe. And it's really important that they receive the appropriate care as well. But we must right. work with the communities. It's so important to involve them because it is a cultural practice. Indeed. So, you know, Indeed. laws and legislation alone will not um, fully end right. the practice. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, st uh, for Fiona Coyle, apologies, director of End FGM European Network. Thank you. And still to come on Good Morning Europe, we'll tell you what Steve Bannon is up to in Brussels. He is causing quite a stir, as we've told you earlier. That will be right after the break. You're watching Good Morning Europe. Welcome back to the program. Now our next story, Donald Trump's former chief advisor, Steve Bannon. He's really ruffling more than a few feathers here in Europe. And Alex is going to tell you exactly why. If Steve Bannon wanted to get people talking Tessa in Europe, he has certainly succeeded. You might remember a few uh, weeks back, Steve Bannon sat down with us here at Euronews. You can watch the full interview. Just Google uh, Euronews Steve Bannon, in which he talked about the state of Europe and how he thinks Europe is going to progress. Well, now he's gone one step further. And in an interview with The Daily Beast, he says he is going to set up a foundation here in Europe called The Movement. And the idea is to stir right wing populist revolt across Europe with uh, a view to building um, a right-wing group in Brussels. Now, people are telling us from Brussels that this is getting a lot of talk. People are talking about it, not just on social media, but obviously in the corridors of power there as well. This is a potentially a big headache for the European Union ahead of the elections in 2019. But Steve Bannon's plan, I suppose you could say, is to stir up the kind of... Um, uh, the kind of fever that perhaps swept Donald Trump into office, this idea of taking back control of borders, this idea of being individual nation states and putting your country first. Steve Bannon obviously was Donald Trump's former chief advisor in the White House before uh, exiting that role. Um, this has got a lot of people talking. Establishment figures in the European Union, you could call them. Guy Verhofstadt, for example, um, backing the social media campaign that's come out of this called hashtag 
Ban Bannon. This is an image uh, shared uh, by Giva Hofstadt saying, uh, Steve Bannon's far-right vision and attempt to import Trump's hateful politics to our continent will be rejected by decent, uh, decent Europeans. He's calling on here, hashtag Generation Europe, to stop Bannon. We must stop Bannon, as Giva Hofstadt starts. David Lammy in the UK calls uh, Steve Bannon, um, I believe he calls him, uh, yes, morally bankrupt and delusional if he thinks his think tank is going to sway things. But there are voices in Europe who see Steve Bannon's move as uh, standing up for what they believe in. And also people taking issue with this characterization of Steve Bannon as right wing. Uh, Martin commenting on our Euronews article saying, far right is nonsense, not liberal is what you mean. And also Mike Bates pointing out that George Soros has sponsored liberal causes through a similar uh, foundation in the past. So he says he's just doing the same uh, to give a Hofstadt as your best mate Soros. So what are your views on this? Is Steve Bannon in need in Europe or is he stirring up bad feelings? You can let us know using hashtag the Q. Another interesting debate. Thank you for that, Alex and Q. And thank you for joining us on Good Morning Europe. Do stay with your news for all of your top stories. And we leave you with today's no comment from Denmark, where despite it being the middle of July, the annual Santa Claus Congress kicked off with more than 150 Santas from around the world parading through the streets of Copenhagen. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh.